When I was a wee pup, one of the first books I ever read was a book about Jim Brown. Right? We would have library time in my school where you had to go to the library for a period and you'd read uh, whatever book you wanted. And I got this book out about Jim Brown. Cleveland Brown's running back, played at Syracuse. And I was able to read the entire book during the course of however many days or weeks it took to go to the library and read this book. And as a result of that, I kind of became a fan of uh, Jim Brown. I never knew him as a football player. He was retired before I was ever conscious enough to uh, watch football. But as an actor, and the first movie I ever saw him in was The Dirty Dozen. And he was my favorite of The Dirty Dozen, uh, along with Charles Bronson, probably. I didn't like Telly Savalas in that movie when I was younger at all. Telly Savalas always scared me. Do, 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 do <laughs> he was bald before it was cool to be bald. <laughs> right? So our next guest is Dwayne Epstein, who has written a book called Killing Generals. and uh, It's about the dirty making of The Dirty Dozen. Dwayne, good morning. Great to have you with us. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Yes. Emph emphasis on the morning, because you're in California. <laughs> uh, very much emphasized. Indeed. In fact, it's still dark out here. You're on the left coast, as they say. So 6, right. uh, 6.38 a.m. your time, but we appreciate you getting the early arrival uh, for your Alrighty. day there. So this this is when when John said to me, hey, you want to get this uh, author on about the, he wrote a book about the movie The Dirty Dozen. I jumped all over because this is one of my top ten favorite movies of all time. What inspired you to write this book? Well, I had written a biography on uh, the star of the film, the actor named Lee Marvin. Yes. And um, it was called Lee Marvin Point Blank, came out in 2013, and it did very well. In fact, it made number four on the New York Times bestsellers list. So even though there was a great amount of lag time between that book and this book, with uh, um, a certain amount of reason, um, my uh, I got a new agent, and he asked me what movie would I like to write about. And he asked me about the movie Point Blank, which is a pretty good film. But I told him that's not necessarily a favorite of mine. How about The Dirty Dozen? And he said, that's not a bad idea. Put together a proposal, and I'll see if – and I'll – put it out there for any publishers to read and we got a deal in about a week or two after i put the proposal together it was a very fast turnaround was the movie the dirty dozen based loosely on any specific mission that was actually uh, taken under undertaken yeah i'll tell you i'm glad you asked me that question because that's one of the things i get asked about the most in that <clears throat> excuse me in that one of the things that it's like an urban legend that's gone on for years is that it was based on fact it was not based on fact there was no such um um unit of of uh, criminals trained to go on a secret mission that never happened it's an interesting story about how the author of the novel em nathanson came up with the idea for the dirty dozen it had to do with the i don't know if you guys would remember a gentleman by the name of russ meyer oh yeah the guy who made uh sexploitation films in the 60s and 70s mm -hmm. he gave uh nathanson the inspiration um to write the dirty dozen which is a fascinating tale. Um, so, yeah, a lot of people think it, it was uh, a unit within the 101st Airborne Division during World War II that called themselves the Filthy 13. They were not the inspiration. They were uh, kind of an off-the-wall unit, but they were not convicts, and um, and they pretty much did what they wanted in terms of their you know, appearance. They didn't shave. They wore um, war makeup, um, um, had mohawks. But these guys were not... Um, convicts and killers who had criminal records. The Dirty Dozen the, uh, of of the movie were. Lee Marvin is awesome in this movie. It, it, Lee Marvin, was, wasn't he a Marine? He fought in World War II? Indeed he was. He was a Marine and he fought in World War II in the Pacific in the uh, in, in the Marines Island hopping campaign, eventually making their way to the island of Japan. But he got wounded on Saipan. Um, and right before they made it to Iwo Jima. And of the, God, I, I, I used to remember the number, but I don't. But out of the huge number of men in his unit, he was one of only six to survive. So it was pretty harrowing for him. Were many members of the Dirty Dozen actually veterans? Um, uh, oh, you mean in the cast? Yes. Yes. In fact, they all, I shouldn't say all, almost all of them were. Um, of of um, I don't think Trini Lopez was, but and Jim Brown wasn't, right? Um, because at the time he made the film, he was only twenty nine, and uh, but yeah, Marvin was uh, John Cassavetes, um, whom I loved in that movie. He was in the Army Reserve. Charles Bronson was in the uh, Army Air Corps. Uh, Ernest Borgnine was in the Navy. 
Clint Walker was in the Merchant Marines. Um, as I'm going through the actors in my head, I'm trying to remember them all. Um, Robert Ryan. Robert, Ryan. Robert Ryan. Oh, yes. yeah. Robert Ryan. Robert Ryan. Yeah. Robert. Robert Ryan was in the Marines. He was a um, a, a, a a weapons instructor. Um, yeah, Robert Ryan. Richard Jekyll, I believe, was in the Army. Um, who else? Yeah, that's a pretty good list. Yeah, you, yeah, it is. That you mentioned several of them. In my thinking, the one of the real strengths of that movie was the phenomenal cast they assembled, and they covered yep. a large spectrum. Uh, do you write about how the cast was assembled? Oh yeah, most definitely. Um, because, and it's interesting because that wasn't. <clears throat> excuse me. Not all the members of the cast that were chosen were all the original ca uh, choices. Um, at one point, Jack Palance was going to play the Telly Savalas. Oh, um, by the way, yeah, yeah, there's another one, Telly Savalas. He was in the Army, too, during World War II. Um, Jack Palance was supposed to play the uh, part of Maggot, but he read the script and he hated it. He didn't want to play that character at all. Um, John Wayne was originally approached to play the, John, uh, the Lee Marvin role, and he turned it down. Um, I think they also were considering Burt Lancaster and uh, several others. But when Robert Aldridge came onto the film after Ken Hyman took over as producer, whom I interviewed, by the way, um, when Robert Aldridge came on, he wasn't crazy about the fact that John Wayne was even approached. He thought John Wayne was all wrong for the part. The one he wanted from the beginning was Lee Marvin. And when they went to talk to Marvin, Marvin was on it. He wanted to do it. Oh, he's great in it. Yeah. John Gilstrap. Yep. Well, right. it's 1967 is when the movie came out, and I've it, it's a fascinating year in films because not only was was it the Dirty Dozen and Cool Hand Luke, and um, guess who's coming to dinner? But it was also the Harris uh, Rex Harrison Doctor Doolittle oh my year. Goodness. So it's 1967. Oh, Bonnie yeah. and Clyde. So 1967 right. is considered like a, a pivotal year, isn't it? In 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 filmmaking. Oh. Yes, very much so. Um, it was it was a kind of a sea change in that American filmmaking of because it had morphed into the modern age of filmmaking with the end of the studio system and the end of the production code. Um, the year that um, both movies like Bonnie and Clyde and uh, The Dirty Dozen came out, that was the very next year is when they put the production code into effect because of movies like The Dirty Dozen and Bonnie and Clyde and Point Blank, that was another one that came out that year. Um, they were they were more violent than um, films had been pre previously, and then it was very controversially so. Um, and so, consequently, the, of all the films that you just mentioned, and it was a watershed year, the one that made the most amount of money was The Dirty Dozen. Sweet. It was the biggest hit of the year. It was also one of the biggest hits in MGM's history. It was also of the movies. Um, I was not allowed to go see, I was 10 years old, I was not allowed to go see The Dirty Dozen. Right. And I wasn't certainly mm -hmm. not allowed to go see Cool Hand Luke, but I was allowed to go see You Only Live Twice, which I oh, saw right. twice in the like same the day. the biggest moneymaker <laughs> that year. <laughs> also, you know, I don't know if you mentioned In the Heat of the Night. I saw that with my parents when it came out. I was like five or six years old, and I had to close my eyes during certain scenes. <laughs> so in your, I know what scenes those are. Um <laughs> in researching the making of that's kind of a that's a, a a big task did you had you heard rumors or innuendos of, that, that made this movie particularly interesting to get behind the scenes on oh most definitely there were as i mentioned at the beginning of our talk um the, you know one of them was that uh the story of the dirty dozen was based on a real unit and i found out that's not true um, that Lee Marvin hated the movie and wanted to disown it. That wasn't true. It's was quite the opposite. Um, that and one of my favorites. And I, I was able to talk to, even though the movie came out quite a while ago, I was able to talk to many of the people involved in the film that were still with us. Uh, main, one of them was uh, the producer of the film, Ken Hyman. Um, he lives in London now. He's in his 90s. And Ken Hyman um, confirmed one of the longest lasting rumors that if Robert Aldridge had changed the end of the film, if he hadn't made it so violent, he would have gotten an Oscar nomination, but <clears throat> excuse me, he didn't want to change it. So he lost out on getting an Oscar nomination. Ken Heim, I asked Ken Hyman about that. And he said, you know, I've been hearing that for years. That's just not true. The reason Robert Aldridge didn't get an Oscar nomination was because he hated the Academy and the Academy hated him. He was <laughs> quite a Hollywood man. Well, how Spoiler alert for the audience. Go ahead and, and recap for us what 
the controversial ending of the movie is. You don't have to give away book stuff, but the sure. end of the movie well, it was, it was a, controversial it because. Was the, yeah, it was the basis of what the mission was supposed to be. They took over this uh, German chateau, the 12, of what was left of the dozen, um, and um, they doused a bunch of gasoline in the basement of where the chateau was and then dropped grenades in and killed them all. And it was pretty violent. And um, Robert Aldridge supposedly said that he wouldn't get an academy. He, he hated the academy. He thought it was all hypocrisy. And he was quite the maverick himself. And he said that if I had directed a biblical movie, which the academy loves, I still wouldn't get an Oscar nomination. And what I find funny is when you look at his filmography, he did direct a biblical movie. It was called Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't get a nomination. <laughs> no, no, not even close. Not the kind of biblical movie the Academy liked. <laughs> well, that was in the heat of the night. Won the Oscar that year, right? Yes, it did. Okay. And you know the very fact, and I'm not putting it down necessarily, but the very fact that uh, um, Dr. Doolittle with Rex Harrison got an Oscar nomination that that was another way the Academy seemed to be thumbing their nose at Robert Aldridge. Because let's face it, it was an okay movie. I guess it was a nice kiddie movie, but it certainly wasn't Oscar worthy. The Dirty Dozen was. And it didn't get any nominations. Well, it got a couple of nominations, technical ones. Dr. Doolittle was no My Fair Lady for Rex Harrison. <laughs> the push me, pull me? Come on. But they've remade Dr. Doolittle. They have not ma remade My Fair Lady. So Have they, re right. have they, made, have they, me have they remade A Dirty Dozen in any form? Oh, my gosh. It became a kind of a cottage industry. Um, after the movie came out, it was so successful. Um, they had... Uh, over time, there were several TV movie sequels. There was a, uh, a short-lived TV series. And also, this is amazing to me, six months after the film was released, ABC had a TV series on the air called Garrison's Gorillas, oh, yeah. which was which was an exact ripoff of The Dirty Dozen. Um, and after the film came out, there were so many uh, Kelly's Heroes, The Devil's Brigade. Yes. Um, gosh, so many movies that were just basically copycats of of the Dirty Dozen. Yeah, too late the so, hero. And, too late by the, the hero. Way, yeah. yeah, I'm sorry. Too late the hero was another one I see. Yeah, and that was also directed by Robert Aldridge. Mm -hmm. Kelly's um, Heroes gets some kudos just because Don Rickles is in it. So, <laughs> right, and also Donald Sutherland playing the world's first hippie. <laughs> yeah, tank driving <laughs> hippie. Great. That's right. <laughs> right. Also, I've, I've heard you know more contemporary films like. Um, Inglorious Bastards, yes. um, Guardians of the Galaxy, they all kind of you know, have a string of Dirty Dozen in them. And I've also heard, too, that there's talk about a possible um, remake making it more contemporary. Hmm. I, 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 so, would, uh, I would have to see that to know if I appreciated it or not, because that cast is just so perfect for what they did. And I'm sure in 1967, I'm sure what they did then was considered violent. It, it's pretty bland by today's standards as, as 50 something years have gone by. But at the time, I'm sure it was pretty shocking. Yeah, and I'll tell you something. I don't know when the last time was you watched it, but if you watch it now, I think it still pretty much packs a really good wallop. It, it, it's still uh, it does. Point really strong. Um, and I remember being told by people in the audience that that's you know that saw it in in the theaters, um, Jim Brown making that run. Yes, you know people actually like gasped what happened to him, which I don't really want to give away unless you want me to. Yeah, <laughs> well the movie's fifty six years old. So. <laughs> the spoiler the spoiler thing doesn't matter. Yeah, anymore. if you haven't seen it by now, it's your fault. Uh, Dwayne, right. a, a name that we mention only in passing is uh, Don Sutherland. Uh, was that his first major breakthrough? Uh, as a matter of fact, it was, well, he had, he had he had done some work before. He was in some Hammer horror movies, small roles. Um, and I, once again, I was lucky enough to interview him. Very interesting man. Um, and and he got the part in a very interesting way. He was on an episode of that old Roger Moore show, The Saint. And um, he, Roger Moore, I think, directed that particular episode he was on. And he asked Roger Moore if he could send a copy of that episode to the producer. The movie was made in England. Um, and everybody, the, the so-called bottom six of the Dirty Dozen hadn't been cast yet. And Donald Sutherland was Canadian, and he was working for the BBC at the time. And luckily, Ken Hyman saw that um, episode of The Saint, liked Donald Sutherland, asked him to come in, and he got the part. And he did something fascinating with the role. This is what really good actors do, in that there's no such thing as small actors or small parts. There's only small actors. He, was, he wasn't supposed to do 
the scene in the movie where he's inspecting Robert Ryan's troops, that was, excuse me, that was supposed to be Clint Walker. And Clint Walker during rehearsal said he didn't think it was right to have a Native American character that he was playing do something like that. He thought it would be beneath him. And Donald Sutherland told me that Robert Aldridge looked across, across the table, saw Donald Sutherland and said, hey, you with the big ears, you do it. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that one scene changed his life and career because he used that scene like he did with the episode of the Saint, to send to robert altman who was in the process of directing mash because robert altman was considering donald sutherland but wasn't sure he could do comedy and when he saw that scene he hired donald sutherland and it changed his career that's awesome uh give yeah. me give us another good anecdotal story there about the making of the dirty dozen and the people involved oh boy how do you narrow it down there's so many um one of my favorite things in the movie, and he was one, the only actor in the movie to get an Oscar nomination, was John Cassavetes. I thought he was fantastic in the role. Yes. I knew guys like him. He was such a punk, and he played it brilliantly. And he was one of the guys that when they were rehearsing it um, during the rehearsal period, which lasted two weeks, he proudly said, anytime Aldridge wanted to know if anybody was willing to do this, that, or the other thing, he goes, I always raised my hand and jumped up, always. I, I, I was volunteering for anything and everything. He said, a lot of the other guys were cursing under their breath when I would do it. And Cassavetes was like, no, you know, I don't care. I'm having fun with this. And the funny thing is, he didn't want to do the movie at all. He was uh, kind of forced into it financially because he was being sued by Universal. So it was a way to get out of the lawsuit. And what he wanted to do was finish the movie he had been making called Faces, but he had run out of money. And so Ken Hyman, you know, Ken Hyman said to me, John, John Cassavetes is a brilliant director, wonderful actor, and, and a pretty good writer, but he's, a, but he's a great big pain in the ass, is how he put it to me. <laughs> he said he almost got in a fist fight talking him into doing the role. And finally, he just said, John, do the role, take the money, finish your movie. And that's exactly what Cassavetes did. And consequently, he wound up becoming what's often been called the grandfather of American independent cinema. Cool. It changed. It changed the way things were done in this country. You mentioned uh, Cool Hand Luke as uh, same year coming out. Uh, I think as Dirty Dozen, and they share in yeah, common that's, one actor. That's, yeah, that's one of the greatest ironies is that uh, Cassavetes is nominated for Dirty Dozen, but he lost the Oscar to George Kennedy, his co-star from the Dirty Dozen. Yeah, he's in both Who, movies. By the way, was also in. He was also a veteran. He was at the Battle of the Bulge. George Kennedy. Yep. I did not know that. So many, so many of those great actors from that time, they they served in World War II. They had Jimmy Stewart. Yes. Right? I mean, oh, yeah, most definitely. Most definitely. Major stars of, what of screen. The, what, they, you know, what they call the greatest generation is accurate. You, know, they, 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 you serve in World War II, then you come back to America and make and you make movies, and uh, and, and you never heard about it. I mean, I, I grew up not knowing George Kennedy was in the Battle of the Bulge. <laughs> We, which which came first, the title or the number of people in the in the cast? Oh, the title. Okay, I think it, it's it it feels like that would have been the case. Yeah, because it was it was it was it was a published novel in uh, in 1965, um, and I the, the gentleman who wrote it, E. M. Nathanson, he passed away in 2016. But I have a friend who had interviewed him um, at at length, but she never got it published, so. It was an exclusive, and she gave it to me, and I was able to get a wealth of information about the uh, about about the making of. He was also involved in the, in, in the making of the film as well. He had written a draft of the screenplay. Wayne, we've talked a great deal about only the, about thirty seconds left. The, the wonderful cast. My impression, though, Clint Walker was not cast correctly. Your thoughts? Should I say that again? Clint Walker was he appropriately cast? Okay, about 10, 10, 15 seconds for your answer, Dwayne. Well, yes and no. He he looked the part, um, but I don't know how well of an actor he was for the role necessarily. How's that? Posey was his name in the yeah. movie, if I remember that correctly. Samson Posey. I got to interview him, too, quite a lot. Hey, Dwayne, how do we find your book? Oh, it's available on Amazon.com. It's available on better at better bookstores everywhere, BarnesandNoble.com. Um, and it's called Killing Generals, The Making of the Dirty Dozen, the most iconic World War II film of all time. Thanks, Dwayne. Really appreciated the segment, man. Oh, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Good Take stuff. Take care. Thanks, Wayne. <laughs>